Hello. And, uh, let me begin with a few lines of a song, which is almost like an anthem of the Himalayas, which is Vedu Pako Baramasa. Narayana, Kafal Pako Chaita Meri Chela. Now, this is a song which talks about changing seasons. It talks about the romance of the changing seasons. And what it simply tells us is that Bedu, which is a fig tree, it ripens throughout the year. And Kafal, which is a bayberry, it only ripens during the month of Chet, or the months of March and April. So it's a simple love song, but it also has a very deep scientific wisdom embedded in it, is that there is a very special relationship between a wasp and a fig tree. So every fig tree has a particular kind of wasp that can pollinate the fruits of the fig tree. And this relationship between the wasp and the tree helps nature in a wonderful way. That is what makes the fig tree a keystone species. So just as a keystone is the heaviest stone which is kept on top of the arch that can bear the load of the entire building. In the same way, the fig tree emerges as a keystone species. Naturalists, botanists, they've been wondering about this tree, that why does it bear fruit throughout the year? This is because the tree wants its wasp to survive. So both have a relationship which, of course, we can describe as symbiosis. This kind of wisdom was embedded in our folk songs. It was embedded in our traditions, something which modernity has made us forget. So when we think of modernity, when we think of our times, we kind of forget the entanglements of man and nature, of other animals, insects, mammals, and nature which our ancestors understood very clearly. There is a culture of worshipping fig trees across India, and we consider the tree as sacred. The same is the case with our communities in the Himalayas. We have an all-weather road which is being constructed to all the four char dhams, all the four sacred sites. These char dhams are Badrinath, Kedarnath, Gangotri and Yamnotri. Whereas our deities, the devatas, themselves vacate their seats during the winter. So they vacate their shrines and come down to the foothills because they want the landscape to recuperate. They want the landscape to recover from the summer pilgrim rush. But, you know, forgetting all that wisdom, we are building these roads which are running right through to the sacred sites. We are cutting down hundreds and thousands of fig trees to widen that road, to make it an all-weather road. We are building dams. There are more than 500 proposed projects all across the Himalayas right now to have more power for our cities. What we are actually doing by building these dams, or building railway lines, building all weather roads, is that in a way we are hindering our own water security. The Himalayas are very well recognized as the water towers of the world. They provide us with all our drinking water. So outside of the polar caps, there are about, you know, the Himalayas are the only place where you have about 33,000 square kilometers of glaciers. And they provide us with 86 million cubic meters of water every year. This is drinking water, fresh water. We all depend on this water. Now, without an economy, we can still survive. But without drinking water, we cannot survive. But today, the Himalayas, they are facing a grave danger. There are about 600 such sites in the Himalayas where the ground is shifting beneath people's feet. People's homes are breaking, and a lot of these people are migrating to the plains. 
What has led to this situation? We will look at it. It is not that people are not aware, ecologists like me and other people, they are aware because the data which comes from the government records tells us all these things. It tells us that the tributaries of the Ganga have become fragmented. It tells us that the Tiri Dam, which is one of the biggest dams built over the Ganga, is fragmenting the water. It is holding on to the sediments because of which Ganga has lost its qualities that it used to have, that Ganga water would remain oxygenated and it would not rot or decay if it was stored for long periods of time. That unique quality of Ganga water is now deteriorating. We also have a situation where we are losing large amounts of forest. We should have an ideal of 67%, but we only have 45.3% left. We can say that 60% of our springs, they are drying up. We do not have fresh water in the mountains. People have to walk for many, many kilometers to fetch drinking water. We have soil loss, Chargham Highway, which is an 889 kilometer all-weather road, has been built without any environment impact assessment or any geological studies. We have railway tunnels, so we are opening up the Himalayas on all fronts. We have an all-weather road, we have a Karnaprayag railway line, which is going right up to the border. So as an anthropologist, as a person who looks at societies and who looks at social groups, I often wonder why people are allowing this to happen. Why is it that the society is silent about what is happening in these mountains? After all, Uttarakhand has been the cradle of environmentalism. We have had movements like Chipko, which have inspired people across the world. So there were these women in the villages of Uttarakhand who offered their bodies before people could fell the trees and launched a movement which was called Chipko, Chipko Andolan, as we all know about it. There has been a movement against the dam, against the Tihiri Dam, where people preferred to drown in the town of Tihiri, which was submerged because of the dam, rather than move out and shift to safer locations. So a society that has been so vocal about its resources and it has been so, uh, it has protested so much about these resources being taken away from them, what explains the silence today? Why is the society not grouping together and coming forward? This is the question that has been bothering me for a long time. Uh, people like Gora Devi, Tinchari Mai, uh, Swami Manmath, and G.D. Agarwal, who gave up their lives fighting for a better environment in the mountains. These people were dedicated people. They led groups. So why isn't this leadership emerging in the present? Perhaps the question lies with the communities. Perhaps the question lies in the whole idea of modernity, in the education that we are giving to the communities, where people are becoming skeptical about community life. So what is happening in the Himalayas is that, as a student of ritual, when I, when I am looking at rituals, people come up to me and ask questions like, does it really work? Is it efficacious? Will it have any impact? Is it not blind superstition? Is it not black magic? So people from within the communities come and ask these questions. And in order to explain what is happening, let me unpack living in the community in Himalayas a little bit for you. So the Himalayas, they are, life in the mountains is not very easy. It's a tough life. It's an isolated life. During the good weather, you are only storing stuff. You are producing stuff. You are storing food. You are producing you know, fodder for your animals. Just 
in order to store it for the winter months and for the heavy monsoon. So it is backbreaking, it is isolated, it is not an easy life. But people have lived in these mountains, people have lived as communities for thousands of years, and they have led a happy, fulfilled, healthy life. But today what is happening is that most of our villages are being abandoned. People are just giving up now and migrating. This is government data which says that about 3,500 villages have been abandoned. So why is it that people want to just give up and take compensations? If there's a dam being built today, people don't protest, but there is a clamor for compensation. Whereas earlier people found it very, very uh, insulting to ask for freebies. So what I find across villages in the Himalayas is that the social fabric has been torn apart. Communities don't stick together. So communities of the Himalayas, they have unshakable faith in their deities, the devis and devatas that they worship. These are local deities, and the local deities are generally described by people as devta rajas. So they are kings, but they are also divinities. So I use the term divine kings. Now these divine kings may be just idols. They may, may be just statues or symbols which are kept in temples and then they are put in boxes like the silver box that you see and taken from one ridge to another, taken from one village to another. Some of the deities that I have been studying have been traveling for thousands of years. The moment they arrive at one village, people from another village come to take them to their village. So these deities perform a lot of tasks for people. They pronounce justice for one. They bring good weather, they bring rain and snow so that the crops are plentiful. They bless newly wedded people in the village or they would consecrate lands. But what the deities are also doing is that they are marking their territory, that this is my land, you are my subjects, I am the king of this area. So people have unshakable beliefs. They have unquestioned authority, the devatas, over what people believe and what people do. And if I were to describe rituals in the Himalayas in two words, I would say procession and possession. So processions is the movement of the deities, and then the other work of the deities is to either possess their subjects, the people who believe in them, they get possessed by these deities, and sometimes they also get possessed by their ancestors, or they get possessed by spirits. And then the deities are supposed to cure these possessions, if they are harmful and if they are useful, the possessions need to happen. Now to people who are exposed to modern education, this is superstition, this is black magic, this is something which is backward thinking. And those are the questions that keep coming back to me. Coming back to my subject, when I look at these uh, issues in the societies in the Himalayas, where people have begun to question these rituals, where people have begun to question these ideas, there is another field that opens before us which is called STS or Science and Technology Studies. So Science and Technology Studies is an offshoot of anthropology which looks at science in the same way as we looked at tribal communities or archaic communities. So STS has started looking at places where tech happens. Like for instance, they have started looking at the best hospitals of the world and trying to understand how human societies and groups of humans work. And one of the foremost exponents of STS is uh, the French philosopher called Bruno Latour and he has written a very influential book called The Pasteurization of France. So the, what the Pasteurization of France tells us that Louis Pasteur, he's 
whatever he proposed is what we do today in daily life. For instance, we dig drains, or we wash our hands regularly, or we take vaccinations against diseases. And what we now see is that there are other objects, like microscopes, which he has studied in great detail. And what he tells us that is that if a microscope can pronounce a person as sick. So if we are an executive, we go for an executive health check, and the microscope pronounces that we are sick, then we have to be on medication for as long as the doctor prescribes. So what are we doing? We are giving away our agency, the ability to decide how our world will function to a fabrication of steel and glass, which is a microscope. And if we can do that with a microscope, can we not do it with an entity that has supported community living for thousands of years? So this is a question I leave you with. What psychiatrists like Ian McGilchrist tell us is that we have two parts of the brain. The left brain is manipulative. It is the one that likes to control the world. Whereas the right hemisphere of the brain is the more meditative part, which deals with art, which deals with intuitiveness, which tells us how to look at our world, how to understand our world, not manipulate it. And as people from urban areas, we depend too much on the left hemisphere. If we begin to manipulate our world, we think we understand it, we can control it. But that is probably not the case. So what the hills are losing today is because this community living is disappearing and we are manipulating the Himalayas rather than understanding the Himalayas, rather than being one with nature. And therefore we are losing our water, our forests, our land, even our youth, people are being forced to migrate. So I leave you with one quotation from Sundarlal Bahugana, the eminent environmentalist, who said that ecology is, and perhaps the only permanent economy. Thank you very much.